To continue this important uh, discourse on peace, I'm really uh, quite not only pleased but honored to have this next speaker here because she's extremely busy. And she, um, her work is worldwide extensive and that she agreed to be here is, is really, for me, a very important honor. Ms. Ellen Leipson is President and Chief Executive Officer of the Stimson Center. She served for 25 years in government service with her last post as Vice Chair of the National Intelligence Council. She also served on the State Department's policy planning staff, the National Security Council, and the Congressional Research Service. She was a member of President Obama's Intelligence Advisory Board and on the Secretary of State's Foreign Affairs Policy Board. She is a member of the Council on Foreign Relations and serves on the advisory councils of the International Institute of Strategic Studies, the Chicago Council on Global Affairs, the, Gov the Georgetown University's Institute, for the study of diplomacy. She served on the board of the Asian Foundation. It is my great pleasure to welcome Ms. Leipson. Uh, good morning, everyone, and a special thanks to Professor Mahmoudi for including me in this very interesting conference. When I had first uh, discussed with her and agreed to come, I was a little worried that my uh, focus would be a little bit on the, uh, the, the dirty, messy business of the real world and a little bit less of the conceptual and abstract um, ideas of how to promote peace. But I think it's actually a very nice segue from the previous speaker to what I'm going to talk about. She really had uh, dove quite deeply into uh, the specific role of gender in peace building and peace negotiations, and that is at least that general category of uh, the role of global governance, the UN in particular, in post-conflict environments is certainly a major uh, part of what I'm going to talk about. So um, you'll see from, uh, it's actually last week I transitioned from being president after almost 14 years. So I do actually have a little more time to uh, engage in the substantive work, which is of course what gives me uh, greater satisfaction. But um, I've really, I'm very proud of the work that the Stimson Center has done. And really, I'm going to base my remarks almost entirely on a commission report. I think we handed out a one-page summary of the key findings that uh, was released in June by the Stimson Center and the Hague Institute for Global Justice uh, in The Hague in the Netherlands. Um, and we created together a commission as part of a series of activities that civil society and research organizations are doing the, as we prepare for the UN's 75th birthday, the anniversary of the founding of the UN in 2020. The, it's also fitting that we meet in the fall when the General Assembly has just finished the remarks by world leaders, uh, the validation of the sustainable development goals for the next 50, 15 years. So there's a lot of attention right now on global governance for all its strengths and weaknesses, and I think you will find that I am, I, I try to be a, a glass half full person when we look at the UN. Um, there's always, we can dwell on the shortcomings and the criticisms, and it's important that we be uh, transparent and set high standards. We also have to be realistic, I think, about what is achievable in an institution that, after all, is made up of member states. It is it um, can only do what the member states want it to do. It doesn't really have sovereignty of its own beyond the will of its members. And that has been one of the sources of tension in global governance uh, right from the get-go. Right, from, If you go back to Woodrow Wilson's um, early peace ideas throughout the 20th century, there has been, I would say, this tension between whether we want some supranational governance structures that actually have the authority to uh, make decisions and to intervene, or whether we default always to the sovereignty resides in the nation states and we create a democratic structure in which every country has a vote, 
and the uh, institution can only do what its members instruct it to do. So in this whole question of peace building um, and post-conflict, the UN you know, doesn't have its own army. Uh, it relies completely on the will and the capabilities that member states contribute to it. And so I think that's a theme that we'll, we'll come back to again and again. But what I appreciated about this, our commission, was that we were trying to pull together, Stimson generally works on problems of international security, the Hague Institute, the Hague is after all a global city committed to justice, it is where the uh, International Criminal Court resides, the, uh, in the 1910s and 20s it was where the original Court of Arbitration, at which still exists, was based, so the Hague and the Netherlands in general have been a kind of global hub for thinking about uh, and, and acting on uh, global justice. There's a peace palace that interestingly was built by Andrew Carnegie's funding. Uh, right on the cusp of World War I, he built the peace palace uh, where these courts that would try to adjudicate problems uh, between states uh, was established and now there's, it's also where the tribunals for the Balkan Wars and um, at least some of the, the newer tribunals for the African Wars uh, is, are located. So the Hague has its particular focus on justice and we decided to try to look at where are the gaps because security and justice are two universal, enduring, absolutely vital functions of global governance, if you will. Um, and so we were looking for how do we um, close the gaps between them and make sure that when the international community acts in, on, to strengthen uh, capacity of, on the security side and equally has a mandate to act on the justice side, how do we make sure that those two sets of objectives and missions are integrated and, um, and reinforce each other rather than be two separate activities? As we all know, in complex bureaucracies, whether it's the US government or international organizations or maybe even a university, uh, people get focused on their particular uh, mission which, uh, and, and sometimes avoid or uh, don't find it easy to collaborate with people who have an adjacent or potentially overlapping mission. So it's hard to foster collaboration in large complex organizations and that has certainly been true um, at the UN. So now let me first spend a minute or two on uh, definitional issues. So one of the more interesting exercises we had to go through is how inclusive a definition are we going to use of both justice and uh, security. Obviously the nation state system is set up to protect the security of its own territory and its own population. At the international level, what is international security? Is it what coalitions of countries agree to support and strengthen as a, as a political decision? Um, is there something beyond that? And again, the UN was not established to be able to define global security by itself. It was simply what the member states and particularly the creation of the Security Council where the most powerful countries sit and the countries that after all were the victors of World War II, uh, they have disproportionate authority in committing the UN to uh, any particular activities. So the security of the nation state, we were very much drawn to the concept of human security, the full, the full spectrum. Uh, where we now understand that security has to be thought of as a more porous and agile uh, idea that goes everywhere from the rights of the individual to feel safe and secure, uh, then the res who's res who is responsible for providing human security? Um, is it the nation state? Is it the community? Is it the family unit? Um, and is it the international community? So, Without going all the way to using only human security as our definition, we were looking for something that was uh, broader and more inclusive than nat traditional national security um, because we thought that was no longer uh, the appropriate frame to think about the security of citizens and societies in today's, uh, in today's world. Similarly, on the justice side, um, you know, justice is a function of political entities of organizing governing structures, uh, whether in federal systems, sometimes 
with police, as we know, in the American system, you can have uh, institutions that are I responsible for law enforcement that don't belong to the highest level of the nation state. They belong to, they report to a governor, or they may be a, a police service or a, a, a justice system that can belong at the subnational level. At one level, justice can mean just fairness and equity, um, but it can also be channeled in these much more formal uh, directions, and I think the emergence of more international courts when a nation state has failed to exercise the, and, and protect the justice interests of its citizens on, in these extremely un, rare cases, uh, can uh, an authority above the nation state come in and uh, provide a, an, an adjudication process or a system of justice that the nation state itself has failed to do. This is certainly the thinking behind the responsibility to protect um, new doctrine that is imperfectly being implemented uh, around the world. So I, again, um, you know, at the one end of the spectrum, uh, complete, you know, equity of, of rights and access to justice would be the, the maximum goal, but we were also looking at strengthening more formal institutions of justice, particularly in weak and fragile states that are unable to do it themselves. You know, so where is that demand for global just for a global support system or intervention uh, that is because of an, in, an inability of a political unit, whether it's the nation state most likely, uh, to provide that, those institutions of justice. So we um, look, tried to think of, of categories where we could look at this intersection between security and justice. But first let me give you a little bit more of the framing of the study. So on the one hand, we start as believers, supporters, advocates for strong global institutions, that we think institutions matter, we don't think institutions are sufficient, uh, that a lot of the, the things we're talking about are in some 21st century space where institutions also have to learn to be more agile in engaging with actors, civil society, the private sector, et cetera. But we do see, you know, at the 70th anniversary of the United Nations, um, there has been progress in advancing freedom, democracy, justice in, in many parts of the world. There is, I think, the UN, and I hope people would, would share the view that the data suggests some absolute reduction in uh, poverty that has to do with the rise of India and the rise of China, that people have come out of poverty into lower middle class, middle class, and the numbers are staggering when you look at the, Asia, the changes in Asia. But there is, of course, still hor horrific poverty. The country of India has the largest, uh, contributes, has the largest number of poor people in the world. It, it uh, represents a significant percentage of the poorest of the poor in the world. Um, and that we wanted also to acknowledge what's different about how human societies interact and relate to these systems of governance. And there's no doubt about it that the speed and the scale of, uh, and the power of interconnectivity through IT technologies, globalization of economic activity, uh, global, globalization of uh, mobility of people, et cetera, means that um, all of these institutions are feeling a little bit dated, that they're feeling like they can't quite keep up with the way in which the world is changing. And how do we set new norms for providing the core functions of security and justice in a world where borders are, are more porous and where people can engage as individuals independent of their political uh, architecture, uh, which is certainly the world that we live in today. But we recognize in 2015 that um, the world has not been on a, on a linear path to peace and justice um, and, and fairness, that there has been setbacks. We see a rise of of extremism that is generated sometimes by political ideologies, sometimes by religious and cultural uh, trends that perceive themselves as losers in the age of globalization and are looking to um, assert their authority uh, differently. We see obviously towards women, towards minorities, towards disadvantaged groups, 
We have not solved these problems. We've created many uh, techniques and interventions and change values to some extent so that the world is a more transparent and fair place. But uh, obviously we have not been able to change human nature completely and uh, discrimination exists in many parts of the world. Um, in, in virtually all societies, there's some form of discrimination. Um, and then the climate change, I don't know whether there's any uh, people who are still skeptical about climate, but I, as far as I'm concerned, this is now a, an absolutely empirical truth that because of human behavior, it's demography, it's technology, it's this economic growth and success, that we are hurting our planet. And there is there are serious questions about the long-term survival, survival of climate and weather as we know it. And <clears throat> are we ready? Are our societies getting organized and prepared to deal with some of the, the terrible human insecurity um, and possibly injustices that will occur because of climate change? And this is a kind of interesting concept of um, new forms that have nothing to do with the political unit in which you live, but new forms of insecurity and injustice that will occur as a result of climate change. So our commission was premised on the notion that um, surely uh, the international community has to do better, that we have to come up with some smarter ways. Um, we, but I will just give you a flavor early on we have set some high bars of what we hope the international community can achieve, but I would say we are not radical transformers. Uh, we are trying to accept some of the political realities of the UN system as it currently exists and trying to change it incrementally. We are not suggesting that you can do a 180 degree transformation of these institutions. There are some underlying realities of the politics of the UN that we don't think we alone will be able to change. So our commission was co-chaired by Madeleine Albright and Ibrahim Gambari from Nigeria. It turns out the two of them went to graduate school in Colombia at the same time. Uh, they were great friends when they were both permanent representatives uh, of their countries to the UN. Gambari went on to be the undersecretary of the UN for political affairs. He was foreign minister of Nigeria. He also was a peace, the peace negotiator for Darfur. So he has very broad experience in different parts of the UN system, uh, and he's a very um, warm and uh, wonderful human being who really added a huge, a, a very important human dimension to our work. Madeleine Albright stands as a very interesting symbol of somebody who, you know, on the one hand, um, uh, really believes in the UN and believes that the UN uh, keeps disappointing us in a way that it uh, somehow can't quite um, be as, as excellent as we want it to be. She told a, a remarkable story when we met in The Hague to release the report. Uh, she had just brought her children and grandchildren to um, um, the Czech Republic where they visited her family, the, where she had grown up in the houses of her grandparents and they did this kind of uh, family tour and she talked about how the Red Cross, the early years before World War II broke out in full, in, in full measure, the Red Cross, one of the global institutions, visited a concentration camp and gave it a seal of approval because they were shown that people were fed adequately, that they were, that they were doing labor, but they were given shelter and they were given food and she said this is unacceptable that the international community, when it engages with nation states, can be hoodwinked into pretending that things are not as bad as we know they are. So she sets a bar of, you know, I have every expectation that we can do better, that we can build a better international system. So she comes with a, a very strong moral imperative about how to improve um, uh, these institutions of global governance. So we put together sort of your ideal group of people representing very different constituencies. Uh, you'll see on the piece of paper, if you have it, uh, who the commissioners were. They were from uh, Brazil and Indonesia and India and China. And uh, we had the Perm 5, but we also had many of the key players from the developing world, the Global South. Um, but this, in a way, is the most important uh, Let's see if it's all coming.
So here's how we think about the work that we were doing. That we see that governance is a larger concept than government because there are other actors and processes that come into play. We see security and justice as core responsibilities of governments, but there are places where um, security and justice are required and they live outside of government control. So this, these are some of the areas in which we were um, most interested in uh, focusing and trying to see if we can improve when governments fail or when governments are insufficient, how does one strengthen uh, processes of security and justice um, uh, using newer, more agile and flexible mechanisms. So again, as uh, very similar to uh, Professor Goetz's uh, work on women in peace building and post-conflict, I think where the connection between security and justice is um, indisputably strong is in these fragile states um, and countries coming out of violent conflict. This is a core function of the UN system. It's when, what the Security Council spends most of its time on is setting mandates for peacekeeping. Today's world, as you may know, 100,000 peacekeepers uh, in uniform with blue helmets, 20,000 civilians in those operations as well. And the UN system supports another 20,000 helmeted uh, soldiers under the African Union so that there's a cooperation between a regional organization and the UN in staffing the peace operations in the African zones, South Sudan, Democratic Republic of Congo, and in, uh, recently the Central Af uh, African Re uh, Republic, the CAR. And I'll say a word about that later. But we wanted to go farther and we looked at climate and the, the hyper-connected world economy as two arenas in which you might not see so clearly what's the security piece of that, what's the justice piece of that. But we thought, so it's more implicit in the case of climate change and the global economy, it's quite explicit uh, in the case of fragile states because literally when the guns stop, you have to both provide security and get back on track whatever law and order system you had, that that country had, uh, to be able to manage the post-combat period, to get the combatants to put down their guns, to rebuild people's trust in their, inst in their institutions of law and order. So it's clearest in the case of the fragile states, um, and I thought you heard about that a lot in the wonderful presentation that preceded me. In climate, insecurity is of course climate-driven migration, uh, people who's homes, it's not just their kind of local neighborhood, but what about these small islands? What about literally nation states that the entire nation's territory is vulnerable to climate change? So there's, that, at that one extreme, there's profound insecurity that will, is being caused and will be caused by climate change, so that the insecurity piece. But the justice piece is, um, you know, if we have the universal values that all human, that all human lives are of equal value, uh, who is responsible for finding uh, new settlement and new uh, lifestyle and citizenship for the people that are displaced by climate change? So there are very profound, almost existential questions of security and justice that will come out of climate change as the decades uh, go on. In terms of the global economy, it's a little, again, trickier. On the one hand, um, the, you know, the internet and the IT age has been a great equalizer that people have more access um, and it has allowed individuals to be empowered in ways that they were not in more traditional societies. But <clears throat> we're seeing things like intellectual property theft. Um, we're seeing, you know, states are vulnerable in, uh, in the information age. Um, and as we see this nonstop conversation about uh, privacy, protecting data, et cetera, that is a form of insecurity. Um, and where do we adjudicate? Where is the, are the justice mechanisms? I mean, the president just hosted his Chinese counterpart, and I think some people wanted him to be much tougher about the cyber, uh, cyber issues. So where, where's the, the justice when there are cyber crimes? So all of the, these issues may seem a little less direct than in the case of fragile states, but we really wanted to explore, is the UN system up to the challenge? Do we have 
the mechanisms in place to deal with the security and justice dimensions of both climate change and the global economy. Um, so just briefly, a little bit of background that we're providing. Obviously, the migration numbers are going up uh, even farther. Um, the, the, the human migration story is, is a stunning one in the 21st century. Many countries now have the largest population of not locally born that has ever been recorded. So the United States was always an immigrant society, always a culturally diverse place. Countries that never had uh, immigrants are now all discovering. I mean, when you think of the Nordic countries with now 10, 15 percent um, populations from the Muslim world, uh, the, this, these are major social changes, social and cultural changes that are happening in many other countries. In some ways, the United States is ahead of the game, has more resilience, has more knowledge of um, how to manage migration, although we have certainly not been generous this year, uh, and maybe that will change. Um, but in terms of the capacity of the international system, as I, I gave you the quick stats, 100,000 peacekeepers, um, but that the spending on peacekeeping is less than half of a percent of world expenditures on, um, on defense. So there's an imbalance here between uh, on the priorities and the resources that are being dedicated to trying to get some of these countries back on their feet. Uh, the number of peacekeeping operations, I believe, is 16 now. Some of those have been there for a very long time, and there's not a lot of fighting. Probably the places where that cycle of uh, post-conflict and then slipping back into conflict, that's probably 10 to 12 of the places in which peacekeepers are, are located. Um, but again, on climate, um, here are some estimates that are coming out of it, the international community. Um, 150 climate, million climate migrants uh, by 2050, but we've hosted people from the small island states. Literally within this century, we will see some, you know, uh, sovereign territories disappear. There's already negotiations. Uh, I don't know if you know, the, uh, the Maldives has held a cabinet meeting underwater where they all, um, they somehow, uh, you know, uh, to show what it was going to be like when their uh, country was underwater and they're beginning negotiations with India about, uh, already a very crowded country, um, about uh, the relocation of some of their population. Uh, and then on the economy, uh, what triggered our interest in the economy is a, a judgment that the response to the world financial crisis of 2008 and on um, showed that the institutions, nobody knew who was responsible for trying to, um, that, you know, obviously you have the rich countries, you have the IMF where the Board of Governors can be meeting, that you have the uh, governors of central banks all getting together and wringing their hands, um, you have trade negotiations happening in, in different institutions. The sort of aspirational goal here was whether the international community could do a better job at warning and preventing a future economic crisis, um, but also building more resilience into the system. Is there more that can be done? Is there more, are there, are there quicker ways that countries that go into economic crisis because of something that was cross-border, something that came from the external environment? Uh, is there, can we build some more resilience into the system? Uh, and then uh, one of the sort of easy, low-hanging fruit, I would say, was just, furthering the progress of internet access as a great equalizer of human rights and of, of human economic potential. That building even more access to the internet in countries where it's less available is a major step forward in, in terms of equality and justice in the international system. Um, <clears throat> and then more broadly, we tried to then look top down, okay, how would we change the architecture? I myself am a little more um, uh, of a realist than I think some of our friends at the Hague Institute of where is the demand or the appetite for major change in the international architecture. I think that we have to acknowledge that <coughs> the demands of the emerging countries are for now very self-interested. They are not thinking the way President Wilson or the founders of the UN were about what is good for everybody. Instead, they come with 
a, a grievance or a resentment that the UN system currently does not give them what they think should be their fair share of decision-making authority, power, influence, et cetera. But they're not necessarily saying, how could we build a better UN that would be fair to everybody? So what we have right now is still we're a little bit stuck in a north-south debate. We're a little bit stuck with the north being resistant to too much change, willing to improve to some degree, um, you know, who gets to be on commissions, who gets the senior jobs at the UN, there's some accommodation there, but the demands of the South are, at, at this point, I would say, not very coherent. Um, it's really each country looking after its own interests. I want more slots in the UN Secretariat. I want uh, to be a permanent member of the Security Council, but I, I don't believe yet that we have see any north-south consensus on how much change um, will the UN system be able to bear. Um, but we accept that change is needed and that we've got to be pushing ourselves and this commission is one of the conversations and we're very inclusive of other conversations, the International Peace Academy, um, other groupings, and we've been visiting each other's conferences and trying to identify where are there areas of of emerging consensus, at least among experts and civil society members, uh, to propose to the UN by its 75th birthday um, what, what can be done better. Um, so let me just run through some of our recommendations and then maybe we'll have uh, a, good, a little bit longer to, to talk. Um, one, and this very much relates to the earlier presentation, for sure the conflict mediation function of the UN is one of its absolutely most important things. If you think that the UN was originally created with a peace and peace and security mission and that all the other stuff it does have sort of derived from that but that the fundamental core essence of the UN is to prevent war, to prevent another world war but also to prevent any interstate conflict much fuzzier on what the UN's role is supposed to be about internal conflict um, and, and conflict prevention. But if we accept that the UN really can and should, and it's not too hard, uh, increase its capacity to have successful outcomes in its post-conflict interventions. And I completely agree with Anne-Marie about you know, more women in the senior leadership positions of UN missions, <coughs> more women police, um, so that in, in countries where gender is a, is a source of segregation, that the, that the isolated population can talk to a policeman. I mean, India has already proven that it makes a huge difference to have women uh, in the police force so that when there are crimes against women and they go to the police station, instead of them getting abused yet again, uh, they can be with a woman police officer and the whole process of access to justice is greatly improved. It would make a huge difference. And I, you know, again, I agree that women should be at the peace table, but the UN has to be more um, proactive in recruiting appropriate and, and training women to be in positions of authority at all levels of peace operations, to have a presence on the ground. When the UN deploys, there have to, it has to be more gender balanced and it will achieve better outcomes because we know that in the civilian protection world, which the Simpson Center works quite a lot on with the UN, um, how to strengthen the training and the, the clarity of what a UN peacekeeper is supposed to do when the civilian population is at risk. When you think about it, when the UN usually goes in, they're just talking to the combatants. They're just trying to separate the guys with guns. Meanwhile, the civilian population is very vulnerable for lots of reasons, and we're writing this language about civilian protection. This came out of the genocide prevention um, responsibility to protect debates of the last decade and a half. But civilian protection is the new thing, and um, uh, you need you know, people who can access those vulnerable populations. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> so, uh, we're looking for greater role for women in these operations, greater resources, quicker deployments, and this gets to a long-standing problem that countries, uh, in the time that I, wor I worked for Madeleine Albright at the UN in the mid-90s, and at the time there was this talk of countries pre-designating a battalion of its armed forces 
that would then be mobilized quickly when a new uh, Security Council mandate was issued. Instead of having to go out after the resolution is passed and start put out a call for who can contribute uh, 10,000 troops, you would have predetermined, pre-approved units of militaries around the world that could get to the conflict zone quickly. Um, I would say we have underperformed as an international community in making that real. Uh, there's always reasons, people have other jobs, they're not, you know, so that countries have not really been able to commit that they will pay the salary of someone waiting for them to be deployed. So the person does have another job, but they are in a unit that in theory is designated as a forward deployable unit. So anyway, there's a lot of tactical things like that that the UN has to do. Um, we also wanted to revalidate or strengthen the R2P concept, um, which as you know, there was a lot of pushback. Um, poor, small developing countries that are struggling with conflict um, really resent the notion that the international community will decide, give them a grade, you know, you haven't been competent at protecting your own civilians, so we're gonna do it for you. That's a very controversial idea. It was Canada and the Nordics and the United States that thought this was a grand idea, and guess what? The receiving countries um, have been uh, quite resistant and it's been hard to implement. Um, and then on the justice question, um, we think that again, big bureaucracies don't forget to talk to each other. There has to be more of a bridge between the Security Council and the International Criminal Court. There has to be a better flow of information and understanding. On climate, one of our big judgments is that, you know, the national delegations that go to these mind-numbing conferences on climate change are not the only actors. Um, so we wanted to encourage the climate change connections that are happening between cities, uh, between provinces of countries, within countries. There's a lot of subnational and civil society interaction that can happen that will build more commonality of behavior on climate change that has to happen. You can't leave this to your environmental delegation that sits at the three-day international conferences. Um, looking for ways to share uh, green technology in a more equitable way um, and um, uh, talking about the moral dilemmas of geoengineering. I know this is a uh, this is a technical issue that we don't have to get into, um, but there has been pushback on some of the ways that technology could try to uh, intervene in climate phenomena that I think people feel it's a little bit like the older debate about the human genome of when do we go too far. We, the science may tell you that this is a new frontier, but there are moral and ethical dimensions to this of if we don't fully understand the consequences uh, and there will be other costs down the road, how do we manage and, and set some standards and govern those kinds of developments? And then on um, the e economy, one of the simpler ideas we came up with in addition to internet access was uh, cyber crime centers to be training at kind of more uh, grassroots level in a way, um, particularly for the countries of the global south, how to manage um, the, uh, the, the ubiquitousness of cyber crime, of cyber stealing, whether it's identity theft, intellectual property theft, um, leaking of secure, of secure documents. There's just a lot that is happening and we're all potential victims, we're all vulnerable. How do we create some more resilient mechanisms in our societies and set some global norms uh, that would um, uh, affect this? Uh, so very basically, when we look at the macro, when we pull together all these ideas and kind of look from the top down at the UN, uh, I would say that our group could not come up be in part because Madeleine Albright, you know, as the American, um, the, let's be honest, the United States has less incentive to deeply change the Security Council than other countries, and we can't accommodate the demands of all of these countries that we're friendly with. Not everybody can get what they want. So we tend to be passive. We tend to keep looking for, well, if there's a coalition of countries that can all agree, uh, sure, we can endorse, we can support, in theory, expansion of the Security Council, weakening of the veto, maybe not, but I, th I think there are some simple ways to 
make the use of the veto more restricted, and so it will feel to countries of the global south that it's a more democratic process. For example, we, the very simple idea that you could vote no if you are a veto-holding country, the permanent five, you could vote no without it being a veto. So you could determine we, we don't agree with the content of this resolution, but we are, not, we are choosing not to exercise our veto. That would be a huge improvement on Palestine resolutions. There's a whole bunch of stuff that, um, uh, and there was also earlier talk of on genocide questions that the veto could not be used, that, that the, a country that might have be a, an interested party would not be able to veto a resolution that was uh, addressing a, a crime, a, you know, a, a humanitarian crime. <clears throat> Uh, so we couldn't agree. Um, our commissioners from Brazil, from India, um, you know, argue very passionately for a, a very specific uh, accommodation, but they wanted their own country to be named, okay? So again, I would say that one of the things that still needs to be done is for the Global South to have a conversation among themselves and come up with a more shared uh, proposal that the countries of the UN could consider. Instead, it seems to fragment into everybody's looking out for themselves. Um, you know, there is a peace building commission and we felt strongly, in fact, we met in the trusteeship council of the United Nations building. We think the trusteeship council should be converted into the peace building council. And this would strengthen, give more authority, more resources to the peace building activities that we've heard about today. And lastly, we really do promote um, greater interaction uh, among civil society, business, and the formal processes of the UN. But in particular, we think parliaments have been neglected and that parliaments, um, as we know, they don't always agree with their own executive branch, but parliaments can be greater transmitters of knowledge and understanding of the UN system. They can help uh, inform publics and they can bring obviously their own views to the process. Um, again, I come from a realist perspective. I think the best we can hope for is incremental change. I don't think there will be consensus for a radical transformation. Um, I think the UN um, the, and that lack of will to change certainly is something that haunts the United States. The United States as one of the creators of the UN should be a, a strong advocate for its continued success and effectiveness but in truth, we are the only country in the world that doesn't need the UN, okay? The United States usually faces this predicament of, well, we can either go through the UN or we can do it ourselves. No other country feels that way. Everybody else feels that when you go to the UN, it is because you need the UN. So we are, in some ways, the, you know, the lack of political will is us. Um, it's also many other countries that, as I said, are promoting their own interest and not thinking about the global interest, the interest of the global community. Um, and then, of course, there are conflicts over the particulars of how you might change and redesign uh, the UN. Um, and resources, of course, is a serious question. Um, I think the distribution of funding for the UN is still uh, too much on the shoulders of the United States and Japan. I think China should be paying more. I think that um, the, um, the emerging economies should be um, taxed at a higher rate to generate more resources uh, for the UN, but that's a, that's a, a, long, a long standing issue. So I think I'll, I'll just wrap up there. I, I want us to, you know, I, again, we, we want to be aspirational, we want to set a high bar, but we also want to uh, be able to measure change in real time. We want to say that within the next five years, some improvements can be made in how the UN manages um, its very important role. I think that if we think about migration, the migration crisis, and here I, I should have said this much sooner, the specialized agencies of the United Nations, the ones that are not necessarily based in New York, really do some of the UN's greatest work. Uh, the International Migration Organization, the High Commissioner for Refugees, the High Commissioner for Human Rights, UNICEF, um, some of these organizations do remarkable work um, and I think while they're, you know, if you just take the Syrian crisis alone, what a tragedy that they have been feeding millions of displaced people and without resources they are reducing the food basket and some Syrians are being told you have nothing. That is completely 
the international community doing right and then not doing enough. Um, so that is a chronic story of the UN, that there's countries pitch in at the beginning of a crisis, they get fatigued, they move on to another problem, and the UN is left not because it is incompetent or unwilling to go to scary places. The UN wants to do the right thing, um, and if the member states don't uh, resource it properly, it just can't get done. So the migration crisis is one arena in which I think we should see that you know, the cup is definitely half full in terms of goodwill intentions and human talent and capability. It, th those are services that can be provided, um, but back to the nation states to, uh, to provide the means uh, to do it. Um, so I, um, uh, again, let me end there, and uh, I really await your questions, and I'm sure some of you have your own UN experiences and maybe some good suggestions for how to reform it. Thanks. interesting how the, this uh, talk really is a wonderful ending to this morning's uh, three presentations. We went from specific community projects to looking at the women around the world, and now we've received this amazing global perspective on security and justice, uh, and it's quite incredible. Thank you so much for that very important <laughs> presentation. Please come up to the microphones if you have questions to ask. This is the time.